Uh, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. So I guess uh, you know you've probably been to uh, five of these now, and you're thinking, "Geez, these are really terrible." And Andy has uh, sold me under the bus, so you can email me and tell me what a bad idea it was uh, to be here. So I have uh, changed my talk a little bit from what I apparently gave on April 29. Uh, it has been focused a little, and uh, it's going to be a little narrower than I originally conceived, just because it was uh, too broad. But I still hope that it will appeal both to the homogeneous and heterogeneous uh, sections of our center, because it will certainly provide an idea of how, in specific cases, the heterogeneous community can really help the homogeneous community characterize what is going on in their reactions. OK, so I'm going to start off with one slide. Tejas told me there were some undergrads here from Leadership Alliance. Is that true? Yes. Yes? Right here? OK, so we're going to start off with one very general slide and then start to <coughs> focus down a little bit more. A fairly controversial topic, somewhat surprisingly, is how do you define homogeneous and heterogeneous? So we'll spend uh, a couple of slides being pedants. Uh, then we will try and assess why it's important to know whether your catalyst is homogeneous or heterogeneous. And the bulk of the talk will be spent coming up or describing the tests that we can use to see if a homogeneous catalyst is heterogeneous. A couple of slides on heterogeneous homogeneous catalysts, because that uh, is something which could be a future direction for the center to go in. So we're going to take the first three of these uh, introductory slides in one section. OK, so why do we care, firstly, in a very general sense, about catalysis? The reason that we care so much about catalysis is that almost 90% of chemicals that are produced commercially require a catalyst in some stage of their synthesis. And what does the catalyst do? The catalyst facilitates reactions that are kinetically different, difficult. So let's imagine that I have two reagents, A and B. And we could say that these two reagents, just for the sake of argument, are carbon monoxide and hydrogen. If I have a tank of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, uh, it will sit for 500, 500,000 years without anything happening to those tanks, to the gases in that tank. But if I take my tank of carbon monoxide and hydrogen and I add a catalyst, I can get a fast reaction to make fuels in some cases, which is known as the fischer troeltz process. So the catalyst is facilitating uh, this reaction. So the definition of a catalyst is a substance that alters the rate of the reaction without being consumed in the reaction. So in principle, at the end of the reaction, you should be able to get your catalyst back in the form in which it started. In practice, this is not always true, both because of problems related to separation and also because your catalyst will often decompose or deactivate during the reaction, which prevents its recovery. We need a metric to define whether or not a catalyst is good. At least in the homogeneous community, the metrics that we typically use are turnover number and turnover frequency. The turnover number simply defines how many moles of, of product do you produce per mole of catalyst? So if I run my reaction with one mole percent catalyst loading, this means that I will end up with a maximum of 100 turnovers. We also want to know how fast our catalyst operates. If I have a catalyst which takes 100,000 years to turn over 100 times, it might be a good catalyst in the sense of turnover number, but no one, even in the life of a grad student, 100,000 years is too long. 
So we need a catalyst which is going to turn over quickly and we define a turnover frequency where we add a per time unit at the end of the expression for turnover number. So we want to know how many times our catalyst turns over in one hour. There are other factors which are important in assessing how good your catalyst is. At least for the purposes of this center, we're interested in are we using sustainable materials. We're interested in uh, how difficult is it to make our catalyst. We're interested in the selectivity of our catalyst. But at least as a first pass, these are two of the most important metrics that we can use for assessing our catalyst activity. Okay, so we're going to now move to the topic of today's talk and to go back to describing different types of catalyst we can look to the literature and the first attempt to define different types of catalyst was made in 1901 by Ostwald and he described four different types of catalysis so type 1 was release in supersaturated systems type 2 was catalysis in homogeneous mixtures Type 3 was heterogeneous catalysis, and type 4 was enzyme actions. Does anyone know what Ostwald means when he talks about type 1, release in supersaturated systems? Does anyone know what else Ostwald is known for? Ostwald ripening? Ostwald ripening, which is a form of how crystals grow. And it turns out that at this stage, they thought that crystallization was a form of catalysis rather than a physical process and you can initiate uh, crystallization by using a seed crystal or even a particle of dust. Some of you might have done an experiment where you scratched a, grass, a glass surface. This is a physical phenomena so it is no longer considered to be part of catalysis but at least in 1901 this distinction was not clear. These days, the distinction between homogeneous and enzymatic catalysis has also become blurred. This is largely due to advances in bioinorganic and bioorganic chemistry. So if I draw this and say it's a catalyst, everyone will happily recognize that as an enzyme. But after all, an enzyme is made of polypeptides. So if I draw this and say that it catalyzes a process, this is the type of chemistry that my colleague Scott Miller does at Yale where he's got a series of peptide catalysts for organic transformations. Is it an enzyme catalyst or is it a homogeneous catalyst? It's no longer so clear. And then we can go one step further and look at, for example, a conventional homogeneous catalyst such as this nickel complex which comes from Dan Du Bois' group at PNNL and this mimics are enzymatic catalysis and as a result it's very difficult to artificially draw lines between an enzymatic catalyst and a homogeneous catalyst and we no longer uh, make this distinction and we typically consider all of these types of catalysts to be homogeneous catalysts. Now you might think that the distinction we've basically knocked out three of Oswald's four classes from 1901. It took us 113 years of research to get there. The fourth one is very clear. The difference between catalysis in homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous catalysis. Well, it turns out that that one has also become blurred. Typically, the way we think about this is we think that a homogeneous catalyst is one which operates in the same phase as the substrates. So if we had a liquid, we would have a homogeneous catalyst in the liquid phase and our reactants also in the liquid phase. And we think of a heterogeneous catalyst as something which operates in a different phase to the substrates. So a classic example could come from industrial chemistry where you have a fixed bed reactor which has your catalyst in it, your catalyst is a solid, and you're going to flow gases, which are your substrate, over the fixed bed reactor, and you're going to generate gaseous products. This would be a classic example of heterogeneous catalysis. And at least in that case, it's pretty easy 
to differentiate between heterogeneous and homogeneous catalysts. Okay, let's look at a more subtle case, which is if you think about some of the work that Shohang does, he's working with nanoparticle catalysts. And then you could imagine that my group, instead of making a catalyst which only has one metal center in it, it has, say, 10 metal centers in it. And at what point do we say that, for example, this iridium cluster with four iridiums is homogeneous or heterogeneous, and this iridium cluster with, say, 8 or 12 is homogeneous or heterogeneous? Or if we extrapolate the number of iridiums to 300, when do we say that the solution containing these two things is either homogeneous or heterogeneous? You can say, well, is it when I can see particles in solution? Well, the problem with this is you have someone like me with their conventional four eyes, and you have someone like Wes with his 25-25 vision, and he will not see uh, I will not see the solid before him. So it's a very arbitrary distinction. And if we think about some kind of chemical properties, you could say, well, when does a cluster start reacting like a bulk metal? So for example, what are the properties of metallic and metallic iron cluster? Which, how many ions do I need in that cluster before it starts acting like bulk, a bulk iron? Well, the answer is depending on what property you choose, the number of iron atoms you need becomes variable. So if you're looking at the ionization threshold, it might be when n is equal to 25. If you're looking at some kind of redox property, it might be when n is equal to 300. So for these cases where you have metal clusters acting as catalysts, which is actually very common, it's quite difficult to come up with a clear distinction between homogeneous and heterogeneous. What this has led to is a new definition for the phases. And instead of being based on the physical properties, it's based on the mechanism. And in this definition, we can say that a homogeneous catalyst has a single molecular site. So one site which is catalytically active per molecule or per cluster, whereas a heterogeneous catalyst is one that has a collection of adjacent sites. So the potential to have multiple active sites. Now, this definition uh, works quite well, but it's using the same language that the previous definition has used. So this is going to cause confusion in the literature because I've now defined, using the same words, homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis in two different ways. What this has led uh, my colleague, Bob Crabtree at Yale, to come up with is a different word. So even uh, someone who grew up, grew up in Australia, uh, sort of with the rednecks like me, knows that uh, genius is the suffix in Latin for type, and topic, topos, is the uh, Greek suffix for uh, site. So Bob has proposed homotopic catalysts as being catalysts that have a single molecular site, and heterotopic catalysis as being a catalyst with a collection of adjacent sites. So this is the same definition as above, but now with a different language, so we can uh, differentiate between conventional homogeneous and heterogeneous and homotopic and heterotopic catalysis. Now, maybe like me, you feel at this point uh, that you are confused. <laughs> you have a confused face on, and that is the current state of the literature. There is no clear uh, definition of homogeneous or heterogeneous, there is no clear usage of heterogeneous and homogeneous versus homotopic and heterotopic. For today's talk, I am going to use the conventional definition of homogeneous and heterogeneous based on the phases. We've, I've already pointed out that there are 
problems with that, but I will be consistent uh, in my usage of uh, that description. So one final note is that if I have a heterotopic catalyst, catalyst and the thing that makes this nice is that uh, something like palladium on carbon, which is a common catalyst for hydrogenation, would be a heterotopic catalyst. And then we have a problem with the old definition of homogeneous versus heterogeneous, which I'm going to use. If I graft a homogeneous catalyst on to a solid support, we would say using the conventional description that that's a heterogeneous catalyst. Right, but what we're arguing is that we now have a single site which is doing all of the catalysis, which is the molecular compound grafted onto the solid support. And the nice thing about Bob Crabtree's definition is that this would come up, be classified as a homotopic catalyst under his definition, which seems like it's fitting in more accurately with how we would expect it to operate chemically. I think you may underestimate your confidence with your description, Craig. A vote of confidence from Christoph. <laughs> That's also a new term that was easily quantified. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so why do we care about homogeneous versus heterogeneous? Why have I spent the last 10 minutes uh, going through it? So what are some of the characteristics of homogeneous catalysts? We've just said that they're normally single site. Single site implies good selectivity. Selectivity is a desirable characteristic when you are doing a chemical transformation. For a homogeneous catalyst, our techniques are typically better developed for studying uh, the mechanism. But we run into large separation products large separation problems. It's very difficult if you have a solution containing your products to necessarily isolate from that mixture the catalyst. And if you're running an industrial process, you probably want to recover your catalyst, especially if it's based on a precious metal, so you don't have to use it. So here we have an example of a very famous olefin metathesis catalyst. It's Grubb's second generation catalyst for which he was won the Nobel Prize. And this technology is used by something like 60% of the world's 50 largest chemical companies and 80% of the world's largest 50 uh, pharmaceutical companies. That gives you an idea of how ubiquitous and powerful that technology is. If we look at the characteristics of a heterogeneous catalyst, uh, it's very easy to remove the catalyst after the reaction. And this is why something like 80% or 90% of industrial processes use a, hom a heterogeneous catalyst rather than a homogeneous catalyst. It comes down to the cost of separation. In many cases, it has a cocktail of sites. This can lead to poor selectivity. And they tend to be significantly more robust. So you're going to be able to get more turnovers, although we typically don't use turnovers for heterogeneous catalysts. Uh, than you will for a homogeneous system. And then we have this other category, which uh, hopefully we'll have time to talk about, which are heterogenized homogeneous catalysts, where you essentially attach a homogeneous catalyst onto a solid support, which is inert. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to take advantage of the best parts of homogeneous catalysis with the best parts of uh, heterogeneous catalysis, catalysis, but the big problem, at least so far, has been how do you actually attach it and how do you work out if your attachment is stable, is it going to withstand the reaction conditions, and how do you work out what the actual morphology is of your homogeneous catalyst on that heterogeneous support. Okay, so where does the ambiguity come into it? The ambiguity can come into it because I can spend a year, or let's be honest, my student will spend a year making a really nice homogeneous catalyst. She or he will do a reaction, and it will lead to a highly active catalyst. But the catalyst can decompose uh, into a nanoparticulate metal. And you might not even see any visible color change or precipitate in the solution. 
So you'll see no evidence that this is occurring. We can get a stable nanoparticles in solution where you won't see a different phase which is solubilized by different capping groups. And this goes back to that argument about the distinction between homogeneous and heterogeneous. Here's an example of this. So here we have a ruthenium trimer and that's able to catalyze this reaction where we hydrogenate benzene to make cyclohexane. It takes 60 atmospheres of H2 but this could be a desirable transformation. And this was, reaction was studied in detail by a guy called Richard Finke at Colorado State University who's one of the experts in determining whether or not a catalyst is homogeneous or heterogeneous. And he showed that under the reaction conditions, approximately 5% of the ruthenium is converted to ruthenium nanoparticles. And that's what catalyzes the hydrogenation. Only 5% of the ruthenium goes to the nanoparticles. This means that when you look at the speciation during the catalytic reaction, 95% is still in the form of this homogeneous ruthenium cluster. This means that it's very easy to get misled and think that this ruthenium cluster is doing the chemistry. Let's modify the ligands on the ruthenium cluster. Let's make it better. It's not going to help you because it's the nanoparticles which are doing the catalyst, the catalysis. So the question that we'd like to address in today's talk is how did Finke establish that nanoparticles catalyze this reaction? You can also have the opposite phenomena, a phenomena where you develop a nanoparticle catalyst and you think that the nanoparticles are doing the catalysis, but there's actually some, le some leaching of the metals in the nanoparticles into solution and it's actually a homogeneous catalyst which is performing the reaction. We can also have a look at an example of this. So we're going to consider the case of a palladium catalyzed HEC reaction. It's an example of a palladium cross coupling reaction uh, which are another very famous type of molecule. And it turns out that whether you start with palladium acetate which we would think is a conventional homogeneous catalyst or a palladium nano cluster, in this case we've got iodides as the capping groups, you still go through the same mechanism and the same active species. So let's simplify this a little bit and just look at what's drawn in the red box. What happens is if you have this palladium nanoparticle, you get a little bit of leaching of palladium iodide into solution. This palladium iodide can undergo oxidative addition with phenyl iodide, which is one of the key steps in the reaction mechanism. And then you're into the conventional homogeneous catalytic cycle. If you have palladium acetate, the palladium acetate will undergo a series of activation steps. Uh, one of these will be the formation of a complex which has water bound. This can be displaced when the oxidative addition substrate comes in and you will get to the same common intermediate. Now as you go round the cycle with palladium acetate, you'll keep going round and you'll eventually have palladium I in solution. This palladium I is in equilibrium with your nanoparticle. So in both cases, what you will see as your catalyst resting state is this palladium nanoparticle. But the catalysis is not being done by your nanoparticle, it's being done by a homogeneous palladium which is leaching out. And we'll also address how the same tests that I described for the ruthenium case can be used to differentiate between nanoparticulate catalysis and catalysis via leaching from your nanoparticle into solution. So why does it matter? Why should we care about this thing? We have a catalyst. The catalyst works. Is that all we're interested in? Now, there is both a practical reason and a fundamental reason why we need to care about this. If I'm a industrial catalyst, an industrial chemist, and I come up with a catalyst, most of the time you come up with a catalyst working on 100 mg scale, 200 mg scale. Maybe if you're an industrial chemist, you'll scale it up 
to a kilogram. But then you have to put it in operation. And now you're talking about really large scale chemistry. And for those of you who do nanoparticle synthesis, we know that nanoparticle synthesis can be very sensitive to your conditions. And that means that when you try and scale up from the bench top to this really large scale, it's much more likely that if you don't know that you're having nanoparticle chemistry doing the catalysis, that you're going to have a problem, right? Because you're trying to make this homogeneous catalyst, and that's not your catalyst, it's this nanoparticle. And your synthesis is designed to synthesize a homogeneous catalyst, not a nanoparticle. Another reason why you should care is that your nanoparticle will be poisoned by a different amount of a trace material than your homogeneous catalyst. So for example, something like carbon monoxide, which is a common uh, impurity in many gas streams, is far more likely to poison a heterogeneous catalyst than a homogeneous catalyst, although poisoning with carbon monoxide by both is possible. That's the applied reason why you should care whether your catalyst is heterogeneous or homogeneous. The fundamental reason that you should care, especially for the homogeneous people, is probably your supervisor has designed, maybe in conjunction with you, this very fancy bifunctional, sterically bulky, or redox non-innocent ligand. Well, if your homogeneous catalyst is decomposing to a nanoparticle, that ligand is probably useless. And you can start with a simple metal salt to do the chemistry. Another reason why you should care on a fundamental level is that if you're trying to understand the mechanism of your reaction, it matters. And if you're trying to design ligands based on the mechanism, if you're going to this heterogeneous uh, catalyst, you need to design a different ligand to what you might think is required if you have a traditional homogeneous catalyst. Okay, so let's move on to how do you tell the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous. What are the tests that you need to do? Before we talk about the tests that you need to do, let's talk about when you need to do the tests. So, for example, uh, you know, you don't just go to the doctor for no reason. There's a symptom which causes you to go to the doctor, right? Your leg is hurting, therefore you go to the doctor, whereas if you're feeling healthy, you don't just go to the doctor and get a whole array of tests done. So the same thing is true here. There's a wide array of tests we're going to learn about for determining whether it's homogeneous or heterogeneous, but you don't just do the tests for no reason. You look for symptoms in your reaction. Another problem is that at the end of this talk, I am not going to tell you there is one test which is completely diagnostic of whether something is homogeneous or heterogeneous. There is a series of tests which need to be done, and then you are going to make a decision based on the balance of probabilities. Okay, so, you know, in America, you have uh, reasonable doubt in your uh, criminal judicial system, you're not going to, if we decide to use that as our criteria for homogeneous versus heterogeneous, you're basically never going to make a decision. You need to make a decision like this court does, it's from a uh, small country in the Pacific Islands, on the balance of probability. Okay, and we're going to now talk about when you should do the test. So if you do your homogeneous reaction and at the end of the reaction, you see either metal coming out of the reaction mixture or you see a very dark solution. Okay, so typically this is most relevant for palladium chemistry where palladium compounds tend to be yellow. If you see a dark solution at the end of your reaction, it is an indication that you're probably forming palladium black and you should run some tests to find out whether or not palladium black is doing the chemistry. Any time you're using harsh reaction conditions, you probably want to look whether it's homogeneous or heterogeneous. So if your reaction is running at greater than 150 degrees, if you're using strong oxidants, 
acids or bases. Most homogeneous catalysts don't withstand these conditions, so your ligand is probably undergoing some kind of degradation. If you observe that your catalyst is halted by a selective poison uh, for, sorry, this should say uh, heterogeneous, not homogeneous, and this would be carbon monoxide or mercury, and we'll talk more about these in a subsequent slide. If you are studying the kinetics of your reaction and you see an initiation period or a lag time similar to what's shown in this graph where there is an onset before a product measured in this case by fluorescence is growing in, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have a heterogeneous catalyst but you should do some investigation to rule out that possibility. Transmission electron microscopy, so if you do TEM, and when you do TEM, you see electron-dense particles, you probably want to do some more investigation. In most cases, you don't do TEM uh, unless you already have some evidence from these five criteria. And finally, and this is perhaps the most important one, is if when you change your ligand, you don't see any effect on catalysis, this is a red flag. So here we have a palladium pincer compound. If when I change the substituents on my phosphine from isopropyl to t-butyl to cyclohexyl to phenyl or to pentafluorophenyl and I get the same catalytic result, that should not be happening during a homogeneous reaction. Similarly, if you run a control where you have the palladium pincer compound and you compare its reactivity to the analogous heterogeneous catalyst, which would be palladium on carbon, and you see the same reactivity, this is another red flag, and you should look at things in more detail. If we're looking at things in more detail, the first thing we should do is run a rigorous series of control experiments. Some of these are very trivial. It's surprising how often we fail to do these reactions. So for example, run your catalytic reaction without the catalyst present. Maybe you don't need it. Uh, run your catalytic reaction with the appropriate metal salt without the ligand. So in our case, we have iron catalysts. Uh, we have these fancy pincer ligands on them. Sometimes we use a dichloride. We should just throw iron dichloride into our reaction mixture and see if that's catalytically active. If it is, that might be telling us that we have a heterogeneous uh, catalyst. You can look at the role of air versus inert atmosphere, sunlight versus dark conditions. These sort of control experiments are useful not just for heterogeneous versus homogeneous catalysis, but just to work out what is going on in your homogeneous experiment. A more sophisticated experiment might involve finding the heterogeneous catalyst which best represents your homogeneous catalyst and looking at the activity of that species. So if you have a palladium species, it might be palladium on carbon. If you have an iridium species, it might be iridium on carbon. It might be for different applications, particularly if you're working under oxidizing conditions. If you're using a titanium catalyst, you'd look at titanium dioxide. Or a ruthenium catalyst under oxidizing conditions, you'd look at ruthenium oxide. So you choose the best heterogeneous catalyst which you think is going to be formed based on your homogeneous reaction conditions. It should not just be a stab in the dark. Now, this is perhaps more complicated, especially for me, which is that you're going to synthesize and perhaps test the suspected nanoparticle catalyst. Uh, it's hard to do nanoparticle synthesis. We've already talked about that uh, before, but at least in this case, he's not here, so we shouldn't give him a compliment, but we know that Shoheng is an expert at synthesizing nanoparticles, so you can get a collaborator to make some nanoparticles. So, for example, gold chemistry is plagued by examples where instead of being homogeneous, it's heterogeneous, but not everyone, even though this is a relatively easy nanoparticle to make, not everyone can reproducibly make 
good quality gold nanoparticles. Okay, so another feature that you should look at in your reaction is selectivity. Selectivity can be a good guide to whether something is heterogeneous or homogeneous. Iridium and rhodium nanoparticles are very good at hydrogenation. Here I've put up two substrates which are extremely difficult to hydrogenate, namely uh, benzene, an even harder substrate to hydrogenate is hexamethylbenzene, and also uh, this nitrobenzene. And if your newly found iridium or rhodium catalyst can hydrogenate these substrates, you probably have a heterogeneous catalyst because there are no known homogeneous systems that are able to hydrogenate these substrates and every example has turned out to be either iridium zero or rhodium nanoparticles. If you're doing a common reaction and you think you have something which is too good to be true, you should probably go back and check. And many of the cases where these have been found to be iridium zero or rhodium zero nanoparticles, they were trying to hydrogenate much more complicated and exotic substrates and they hadn't done the control which would be to look at simple benzene hydrogenation. Here's a question. Does enantioselectivity imply that a reaction must be catalyzed by a homogeneous system? How many people think that it does? How many people think that it doesn't? Okay, so how many people don't know? Okay, well, the earliest example of a heterogeneous catalyst doing an enantioselective hydrogenation was from 1956. And this was palladium deposited on silk, was able to hydrogenate this imine. And when you hydrogenate this imine, you're going to set up uh, chiral centers at these two positions. So you're going to make diastereomers. And this is an example where a heterogeneous catalyst can do an enantioselective reaction. So this conventional wisdom that if you get enantioselectivity, you must have a homogeneous catalyst is not always true. But if you run the control, you might find that palladium on carbon gives you no enantioselectivity. Your homogeneous catalyst with your fancy ligand gives you high enantioselectivity. That is again on the balance of probability suggesting that your catalyst is homogeneous, but you need to run the control because heterogeneous catalysts can give you an antioselectivity. Okay, kinetics is another aspect of the reaction you should look at. Again, we said earlier, if you see a lag phase, it probably implies, or it can imply uh, heterogeneity. So here's an example where we're taking this iridium species. It has a polyoxometallate as a ligand. And it's hydrogenating cyclohexane to make cyclohexane. So a fairly simple uh, hydrogenation. Here are the kinetics for this reaction. Uh, you can see we have this lag phase. And then all of a sudden, catalysis kicks in. We can model this. Uh, on the basis of two reactions. The first reaction is nucleation and formation of the iridium nanoparticles. It turns out that the catalyst in this case is iridium 300, so essentially 300 iridium atoms. The reason that 300 is the number is that is a magic number for closed shell packing. Uh, so if you can arrange them in the right array, you get 300. There are other magic numbers, but 300 is one of those uh, magic numbers. And the nanoparticles are near monodispersed, which means that it's quite hard to see them. Because how many people in this room think that they can see 300 iridium atoms with their eye? No, not even Wes is confident uh, on that one. OK. Seeing this behavior, you could have an autocatalytic reaction where the product is causing in a homogeneous reaction, the product is causing this <coughs> initiation period. So how do we get around that? 
you can try and seed nanoparticle formation. It's known from nanoparticle synthesis that if you add a small quality of the nanoparticles, this can act as a seed for formation of more nanoparticles, and then you will remove the lag time. If you can isolate some of these iridium-300 nanoparticles, you add them to the reaction mixture, you lose your lag time, reaction goes straight away. If you have uh, an autocatalytic process where the product is catalyzing the reaction, and this could still be homogeneous, then you run the control where you add the product to your reaction mixture. TEM can be used to see if you have nanoparticles present, because TEM is far more sensitive than our eyes. Here is the TEM image of catalysis from the previous example. You can see that we have these nanoparticles. They're around 100 angstroms. They're pretty small, but they are monodispersed. Now, the resolution for TM is about 5 to 10 angstroms, and you can certainly get nanoparticles which are smaller than this. The other problem with TEM is that TEM is going to typically be done after catalysis. Right? You're going to run your catalytic reaction you're going to pump down the solution or sort of deposit the solution on a film, see what's on that film, and then study it. Now, this is not always indicative of what is happening during the catalytic reaction. And furthermore, there have been examples where the TEM electron beam will trigger nanoparticle formation, which is the ultimate red herring uh, in terms of what's actually going on in your catalytic reaction. An alternative to TEM, which works extremely well and allows you to monitor the reaction in operando, so while catalysis is occurring, is dynamic light scattering. So in dynamic light scattering, if you have particles in the solution, they will be scattered off those particles in a way which allows you to get an average <coughs> size distribution of the particles in solution. This is the typical output from a DLS experiment. You can see uh, particle size. In this case, you're making particles which have an average diameter of about 115. But the advantage of DLS is it can give you information all the way down to two or three angstrom particle size, uh, which is even smaller than what you can get from TEM. And it is also in operando. Uh, it doesn't tell you whether the nanoparticles are doing the catalysis. It tells you that the nanoparticles are present, but it doesn't tell you that they are responsible for catalysis. What you might be able to do is map the kinetics of your reaction with the kinetics of nanoparticle formation, which you're going to get from the DLS experiment. So you will do two experiments in combination and look if the product distribution matches the nanoparticle uh, distribution. These days we can do more sophisticated experiments, X-ray methods, where we are going to look at the catalyst speciation in solution during the experiment. So in some cases you can do the Zanes or XAFs in solution. In other cases, you can take an aliquot and freeze it and then take it to the synchrotron. So this is one of the drawbacks of this technique is that you need a synchrotron or a high-powered x-ray source to do the experiments. We're going to look at an example using this Carstead's hydrosylation catalyst. So in hydrosylation, you're going to add an SIH bond across the alkyne. This is the proposed catalyst. Now I would actually, if I'm honest, look at this and say for sure it's decomposing to platinum nanoparticles. This is platinum zero. They're all not particularly good ligands. And I guess the referees of this paper had the same objection to me. So they went and they did XFs. And what did the XFs tell them? The XFs told them that during the catalytic reaction they had platinum carbon bonds present, which were about 2.18 angstrom. So what XFs will do is it will tell you the coordination sphere, the primary coordination sphere around 
your metal atom. It told them that they had platinum silicon bonds of about 2.32 angstroms. Okay, there are no platinum silicon bonds in this uh, pre-catalyst, but you can imagine in hydrosilation you're going to generate platinum silicon bonds. And most importantly, it told them that there were no platinum platinum bonds. If you were making nanoparticles, you would expect there to be platinum platinum bonds. Uh, if they took some well-defined platinum nanoparticles and did the XAFs experiment, then they were able to see clear evidence for platinum platinum bonds using the spectroscopy. So they ran the control and it's pretty clear that you're not making a large percentage of something which has platinum platinum bonds during catalysis. You can then do something like uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and what X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy will do is it will provide you with some information about the oxidation state. When they did this experiment you got a binding energy which was consistent with platinum 2. So this is more evidence that this catalyst is actually a homogeneous system. It's very unlikely that your nanoparticles are going to be in the platinum 2 oxidation state. A final set of tools which you have at your disposal is poisons. Okay, You can try and selectively poison either your homogeneous or heterogeneous catalyst. Both mercury and carbon monoxide are the most common poisons that people use for a heterogeneous system. A nice part of this technique is that it's operationally extremely straightforward. It's very easy to do your reaction with a drop of mercury in there, provided you can get your hands on mercury. I think the sale of mercury is banned in Connecticut. Is it banned in Rhode Island? No, so I can come up here and buy my mercury. That's good to, that's good to know. Uh, CO uh, also can work well. This is the earliest literature example of someone looking at a reaction to see if it's inhibited by mercury. It was done by George Whitesides at Harvard. Now this is not a catalytic reaction, uh, but the hypothesis was, as written this is not a catalytic reaction, but the hypothesis was that this reaction was being catalyzed by platinum nanoparticles. So in this uh, reaction we form a metallocyclobutane and we lose one of our ligands, so it's a uh, kind of hydrogen transfer, one, one of the alkyl ligands to the other alkyl ligand. And there was no inhibition by mercury, which was used as being diagnostic that the reaction was not catalyzed by platinum nanoparticles, which were present because of some small amount of decomposition of uh, the starting platinum complex. So why is uh, mercury a good poison of heterogeneous catalysts? It's a poison because it can either form amalgams with, say, your platinum nanocatalyst, or it can simply block the active site by binding, and that's all that's required for poisoning to happen. One of the things you have to be careful with in the mercury test is if you have your homogeneous catalyst, you need to make sure that it is being activated before you add the mercury. Okay, so it might be best to leave your reaction with five minutes, see some catalysis, and then add your drop of mercury, because there's a chance that the mercury is inhibiting the activation process, not the actual catalysis, and therefore you won't get any information. Now, it turns out that catalyst deactivation can occur with a homogeneous system, and what this means is that most people say that the only conclusion you can be confident about is that if mercury fails to poison the system, it is homogeneous. So if mercury does poison the system, it could be either heterogeneous or homogeneous, but if it doesn't poison the system, it's almost certainly homogeneous. It would be nice if we had poisons which we could use selectively for a homogeneous example. In practice, these don't really exist. Different molecules have been proposed depending on the application. So this uh, polymer-bound phosphine has been used by uh, 
Lipschitz's group and what he's looking at is nickel catalyzed uh, Kamada coupling. So he has a nickel on carbon catal pre catalyst. And what he was looking at is the nickel leaches out of solution. When it leaches out of solution, it is uh, poisoned by this polymer bound phosphine. The polymer bound phosphine is too bulky to bind to a nickel nanoparticle, so it's selective for the homogeneous case. So also being examples using this polyvinyl uh, pyridine. This is again good when you have leaching from palladium nanoparticles. So at least these first two examples where you've essentially got polymer poisons are best for this specific case where you have nanoparticles as your pre-catalyst and you're looking to see if there's some leaching of the nanoparticles. This uh, kind of interesting olefin, it's quite sterically bulky, was used by Crabtree in the uh, early 1980s to look at iridium catalyzed hydrogenation and it's selective for shutting down what are thought to be homogeneous catalysts. It doesn't bind to iridium nanoparticles. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult to make and really it's only going to be relevant for a homogeneous catalyst which binds olefins. Right? There's a whole variety of homogeneous catalysts which are not going to react with olefins so it's not a particularly uh, general homogeneous catalyst poison. The stoichiometry of your poison can be important. In general for a homogeneous system you're going to need at least one equivalent of your poison for binding, right? And this is in relation to the metal. In contrast, for a heterogeneous system, if you have a palladium nanoparticle, well, some of your palladium is buried in the middle of that nanoparticle and is not catalytically active. So per metal, a much smaller amount of your poison might be able to shut it down. So if we go back to that example where we have iridium-300 nanoclusters, for the homogeneous case, if you have 300 iridiums, you'll need 300 equivalents of ligand at least. But with that iridium 300 as a heterogeneous catalyst, it might be that only 20 iridiums are active. You only need 20 equivalents of ligand to shut it down. I think this is the final test we're going to talk about before I conclude. You can do what's known as a hot filtration test. In this test, what you essentially do is you take your homogeneous reaction and you filter it either at the end of the reaction or in the middle of the reaction and you test both the filtrate and also the solid residue for catalysis. So you're going to add a fresh batch of the reagents to your solid residue and just a fresh batch of the substrates to your solution. And you're hoping that the solid, uh, the filtration will capture any solids that are formed so you'll see nothing in the case of your, uh, if it's heterogeneous, you'll see nothing in the case of the filtrate. Here's an example uh, of this being done or a technique where this is being done. It's quite an elegant example. It's this uh, suzuki miyori reaction with a palladium catalyst. And in this case, they actually did something a little more subtle. They mapped the growth of palladium. So this, the growth of palladium is these circles. Uh, and these circles completely correlate with product formation. So product formation is uh, three, which are these triangles which grow in here. And then this is the decrease in the product. And this is telling you that as palladium nanoparticles are formed, you uh, form your product, which is very good evidence for a heterogeneous process and not a homogeneous process. Okay, so to conclude, let's talk about these tests. Are they all just as effective as each other? Right, just like say you have different symptoms and some symptoms are more important, we have all of our tests. Which tests are the most important for differentiating between homogeneous and heterogeneous. So the best mechanistic information will come from a measurement which is done during the catalytic reaction. What this means is that something like kinetics and poisoning is going to be more useful than microscopy. Right? Microscopy is done after the reaction. It tells you what's there at the end 
not what's there during the reaction. You want measurements uh, that directly probe mechanism. So again, kinetics directly probes mechanism. Poisoning, although useful, doesn't uh, probe mechanism. And it's preferential not to use an additive. Sometimes we have to, but an additive is going to perturb the reaction mixture, so you are making some changes. So we can sort of summarize the tests. So kinetics, you're going to look at the lag phase, and it's a technique which is performed in operando. It's a mechanistic probe, and it's additive free. Selectivity, this is where you're going to compare the selectivity to previous systems. Again, it's in operando, it's a mechanistic probe, it's additive free. In contrast, poisoning is in operando, it's a mechanistic probe, but an additive is present. So you're going to take these tests in combinations, and you're going to use them to gain information about whether or not your catalyst is homogeneous or heterogeneous. In some cases, it might be pretty clear from one or two of these tests. In other cases, even after running all of them, you're not going to get a conclusive picture on what is happening in your reaction mixture. So Andy, I'm going to stop. I still have about uh, 10 slides left. So what I'm going to say is I volunteer for the next time we run this series to come back and give another one on heterogenized homogeneous catalysts. So just though to finish, I want to put up one slide which might be useful for people who are more interested in this, uh, which is, I didn't have any references on the slides, but here are the references which you can look at, at least for what we talked about. These three top citations are the ones that are going to be uh, the most informative. Or you might want to jot it down if you ever need to look it up. They summarize everything that I talked about today. I have a question about the poisoning with mercury. Um, um, is it true, uh, do I understand this correctly, that no matter what heterogeneous catalyst, they all, without exceptions, are poisoned by mercury? I'm asking this specifically because um, things, I'm not sure whether these are useful heterogeneous catalysts, but things like uh, tungsten or, or tantalum are really very, uh, um, very little, uh, if at all, attacked by mercury. And so I wonder whether... Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a politician, but you're not going to get me, uh, even though I normally speak my mind, to commit to something as blanket as all heterogeneous catalysts are always poisoned uh, by mercury. I I'm sure there I'm sure there are I'm okay. sure there are examples where they are not. Um, so yeah, I mean you can imagine, you know, tungsten carbide uh, catalyzes a lot of reactions. It's much harder to see that uh, binding. But I think the argument for why it is such a good test yeah. is that it doesn't need to necessarily undergo a chemical reaction. It can just sit on the surface and block the uh, block the incoming substrate from getting access to that surface by blocking the active site, right? And it's kind of mercury has that very high surface tension, right? So it likes to bind to itself, and it once it gets in there, it's not coming out. So I think it's not only a chemical reaction; it's also physical blocking of the active site. done uh, uh, experiments together with uh, Trahenk's group of uh, basically doing a reaction in a flask, making nanoparticles, and simply x-raying the entire flask during the reaction, and we can see the appearance of the nanoparticles. We can see about picomolar concentration of nanoparticles kind of in an Eppendorf tube, very reliably, of whether they are 2 nanometer or 100 nanometer, doesn't matter. So that is a new me new method, but I think one could uh, do these things by x-raying the whole equipment during the reaction and well, measuring the appearance of nanomaterials. Maybe Wes and I will take advantage of that yeah, at that some point in time. So there's still the problem that just because you see the nanoparticles right. does not mean that that does the catalysis. So it, yeah, I don't think it, it's a nice, it might be a very nice way 
for high sensitivity de detection of the nanoparticle, you still have to supplement with other tests. But if there's yeah, no nanoparticle formation, you yeah. start to feel more yeah. confident, right? Everything, I guess the take home message, right, is there's not one definitive thing you can do. But you could use a wide angle scattering technique, which, which would show a bond distance change if your nanoparticles were catalytically active. It would show something binding to the surface of the nanoparticle, which is established in literature now, too. What's your time resolution on the wide angle? On a plasma source, 100 femtoseconds. Well, yeah, that, that, that's, I, that's true for the direct chemical reaction. But um, we are talking about, let's say, kinetics. Right. And so we typically work somewhere between 10 second exposures to a minute exposures. So if that is something that is a time scale where you have your reaction yeah, I mean, you're, progressing, you're we can follow this basically live. Yeah, I mean, yours is like doing DLS, essentially. Yes, it's basically. Very, it's very, it's yes. very similar to DLS, yeah. whereas mm -hmm. what's being suggested there is a much more complicated and sophisticated experiment, which really, I think, will not work very well on an ensemble, uh, but will work very well on a uh, very small particle, very, like, a very small uh, concrete system. And you need, the, you need your reaction to be undergoing a reaction faster than whatever the time resolution of the technique is, whereas for yours, you don't. Could I ask a question about the lag time test? Yeah. So are there other it, causes for seeing a lag other than forming a heterogeneous system or having sort of product catalysis? You know, oh, sure. I mean, it could just... In the heterogeneous world, we have like carbide formation and Fischer trophs. You have uranium dioxide reduction, right. that sort of thing. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, it could just be uh, simply some kind of pre-catalyst activation, which is slow and then speeds up. Um, yes. I mean, the, sh the, short, the short answer is <coughs> yes, but it's a red flag and it needs further, it, it is a sign that you need to do further Which investigation. Which still indicates you don't quite understand your catalyst if that's the case, I guess. Right. And you need to do, you need to do something. And it, even, if it, even if it turns out it's not uh, heterogeneous, if you can eliminate that lag phase by understanding it, you're going to get a much better homogeneous catalyst. Questions? Okay, well, thank you again, anyway.